Hello, all my wonderful listeners, and welcome to episode 24. Find a place to make yourself comfortable, because today I'm going to tell you the long and meandering story of the evolution of the human species. I think this episode will be uh, a good end to my series on evolution, as it'll explore concepts like descent through evolutionary time and perpetually adapting lineages of species. These concepts will also be the focus of the next series, covering the evolutionary history of life on Earth, starting with the first cell and evolving all the way up to life in the modern age. The first cell is a good place to start for our human story. Believed to have been found in pools of nutrient-rich muck or along the interior surfaces of hydrothermal vents, the first life was a simple, single-celled thing. It was fragile and rudimentary, with primitive biochemicals that could replicate themselves and not much else. Over nearly two billion years, these rugged cells replicated over and over again, occasionally mutating and undergoing natural selection. Some cells absorbed smaller cells, like mitochondria or chloroplasts, and these evolved symbiotically to provide energy for the cells. Organelles were evolved, like smaller inner organs of the cell that could isolate reactions and perform specific tasks. Life was on the up and up, slowly but steadily increasing in complexity. But for most of these two billion years, life was microscopic, only visible in the form of colonies with billions of individuals, like a slimy microbial mat that covers a rock by the ocean. The descendants of these first cells spread and diverged, diverging into new microbial species. Some of these lineages began living in colonies, and some of the colonies began to stick together in big multicellular clumps. This grouped arrangement clearly offered some kind of benefit over, uh, you know, cells just hanging out on their own, as the abundance of multicellular organisms erupted in complexity with the Cambrian explosion. This complex multicellular life crawled and crept along the ocean floor, and then learned to swim and it came to fill the oceans. The various species, which all began as little microscopic things, all evolved to grow larger into macroscopic organisms like fish and plants and arthropods. These organisms all ate and preyed upon one another, and with their interactions came the evolution of predation, and then the first true food webs, and the first, you know, real complex ecosystems. The oceans became filled with a wild diversity of life. From about 360 to 490 million years ago, many of these marine species slowly moved from their aquatic environment to a semi-aquatic environment closer to the shores of dry land. The plants went first, moving closer to the sun and the surface of the water before gradually adapting to the harsh, dry conditions of the land. The air was brutal for these early plants. It was often too hot or too cold, and very dry compared to the watery habitat they were leaving behind. But the plants persisted, colonizing dry land in another adaptive radiation. The arthropods followed in an adaptive radiation of their own, filling the early plant-covered landscapes with proto-bugs and mini-crabs, with uh, dragonflies and worms of all sorts flying through the air and crawling on the ground. Of the fish who swam in the oceans, a particular group had little fins that extended off of the tips of meaty little stubs. These little nubbish stubs were like lobes of muscly tissue, which helps give power to the fin stroke of the fish. In the ocean, the lobed fins allowed the fish to propel itself through the water with powerful controlled bursts. These fish migrated with many other species to the marine shallows, to the shelves and beaches on the edges of dry land. Over several million years, they migrated further upwards, living in the muddy shallows of swamps and coastal regions. These fish used their muscly lobes like legs, really rudimentary simple legs, to push themselves between puddles in the mud while searching for food. This evolutionary context applied a pressure for mobility, as this species of fish became known as the first tetrapods, the first four-footed and land-dwelling creatures. As life spread across the surface of the Earth and complex ecosystems were established, these tetrapod lineages diverged into amphibians, and later on into reptiles, and later still into a lineage of tiny furry creatures which would become the cynodonts. The cynodonts being the proto-mammals living in the shadow of the dinosaurs from 100 to 300 million years ago. 66 million years ago, an impactor struck the Earth, and it threw up enough ash and dust to block out the sun, choking the dinosaurs and greatly cooling the Earth. The great majority of dinosaurs went extinct during this terrible event. The only species of dinosaurs to survive would go on to evolve into crocodiles, 
as well as the entire lineage of birds. So birds and crocodiles are the only living descendants that exist today of dinosaurs. The mammals were able to withstand the cold and the dark, as they had fur to keep them warm, and they were warm-blooded, so as long as they had food in their belly, cold temperatures wouldn't necessarily kill them. Even still, most large creatures, including mammals, couldn't sustain themselves with all the plants dying, so the only mammals, reptiles, and amphibians to survive were those that were really small and able to feed themselves with a small amount of food and that could withstand the cold and the dark. When the ash cleared and the sun once again warmed the surface of the earth, the surviving plants and animals began the long process of stabilizing their ecosystems, setting up new food chains and new habitats as they adapted and radiated. The mammals and the birds were particularly successful during this period, as they were able to spread out to all the parts of the planet, and they diverged into literally thousands of different species over the next 60 million years. This part of the story brings our focus to a group of mammals that appeared during this era. It brings us to the primates, who emerged as a distinct group around this time, 60 to 65 million years ago. Primates living in the dense forests of Eurasia had adapted to their habitats in several unique ways. First, they were larger creatures who lived off the ground, high up in the branches of the trees. It wasn't unusual for bugs to live in the trees or birds, as they can just fly around to get wherever they have to go. It wasn't unusual either to see lizards climbing up and down the trees, or skittering around the tree branches. And even with all that said, it wasn't unusual to see mammals in the treetops like squirrels and bats and other arboreal rodents. But it was unusual to see such large tetrapods clambering around in the tree canopy, climbing and swinging between the branches. Second, these tree-dwelling tetrapods had evolved proto-thumbs to help them hold onto branches and vines. The need to perceive the branches in a, a three-dimensional space led to the third fascinating adaptation, where the primate's eyes pointed in roughly the same direction in the front of the animal's face, giving it an overlapping field of vision and thus depth perception. This trait is usually found in predators, but, but even the herbivorous and omnivorous primates developed the overlapping field of vision. After all, if you had bad depth perception and failed to grab a branch, chances are you'd fall to your death. This provided a strong selective pressure for the primates to be able to fully perceive the three-dimensional shape of their physical environment. Anyways, this population of primates spent more than 30 million years migrating southward, across the lands that would become the Middle East and Northeastern Africa. At the time, these lands were much cooler and wetter than they are now, and forests existed that the primates could move through. Populations of Eurasian primates died out during this period, leaving behind only the populations who had moved into the tropical forests of Africa. This group of primates, the ones who moved across the Sinai Peninsula and Egypt into Africa, would become the ancestral species to all modern primates, from lemurs to orangutans to humans. During much of the mid-Cenozoic era, these primates flourished. The typical forests were a fertile and accommodating habitat for them, and they were able to undergo many adaptive radiations. There was a huge variety of primates that existed at the time, and they spread not just throughout most of Africa, but across the hot, fertile southern portions of Asia, into the jungles of India, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands, even settling regions in southern and western Europe. Around 12 to 18 million years ago, some of the populations in India and Southeast Asia would branch off to become gibbons, or the lesser apes. These are small and diminutive primates who are similar to the greater apes in that they don't have tails, unlike other primate groups like lemurs. The gibbons differ from the rest of the apes in that they're almost totally sexually monogamous, usually mating with one individual for life. There are exceptions here and there, more so sexually than socially, but in general, the gibbons are remarkably monogamous. Despite this penchant for monogamy, the gibbons have a, a low sexual dimorphism, which means the males and females look alike, and they don't usually make nests. The divergence of the gibbons left behind the family Hominidae, or the great apes, which includes the orangutans, the gorillas, the chimpanzees and bonobos, and us, the humans. I'm going to trace the human lineage down through the Hominidae family, starting with our great ape cousins who diverged first, and I'll work my way through time to our most recent relatives. The great apes of the family Hominidae are relatively large, and they lived in communities of 5 to 10 mature individuals, plus their offspring. The great apes were all omnivores, 
but they by and large preferred an herbivorous diet, with an emphasis on fruits. Fruits are really the staple food in an ape's diet, as they are the easiest objects for the large creatures to find, eat, and digest. Fruits are nutritious, but during droughts or particularly poor seasons, they can be hard to find. When fruit isn't immediately available, many apes will resort to eating the leaves and stems of various plants. Sexual dimorphism varies among the great ape species. In many of them, the males and females have a similar body shape, with the males being generally larger and stronger than the females. After an eight to nine month gestation period, the female great apes give birth to one or occasionally two babies at a time. Unlike newborn snakes or antelope, newborn apes are weak and helpless. They require a heavy investment of time, attention, and food on behalf of their parents, or at least on behalf of the mother, which leads to the mother usually separating the births of their children by several years. The young develop throughout a relatively long adolescence, eventually reaching maturity after 8 or 10 or 15 years, depending on the species. Once mature, apes typically leave their home group to go and find a new one. Okay, so let's get back to the evolution of the Hominidae family. The most distantly related cousin to us in this family, or the first group to branch off into a new species from the human perspective in the tree, are the orangutans. After the ancestor population split into the greater and lesser apes, with the gibbons being the lesser apes who lived in India and Southeast Asia, the greater apes lineage was established. Shortly after this, about 10 to 12 million years ago, the lineage that would become the orangutans diverged from the main group. These orangutans lived in the jungle of Southeast Asia, and they moved outwards into the Pacific Islands. Today, the only wild orangutan populations live in Borneo and Sumatra, large islands that sit between the Asian continental mainland and Australia. With the branching off of the orangutans, we're left with the subfamily Homininea, which includes the gorillas, the chimps and bonobos, and human beings. Around six to nine million years ago, most likely on the later end of that estimate, so closer to nine million years ago, the gorillas diverged from the main Homininea line, and they formed their own lineage called Gorolini. The Gorolini tribe would go on to form two genuses, called the Eastern and Western Gorillas, who inhabit small regions of land in the Eastern and Western regions of the jungles of Sub-Saharan Africa. There's much concern for the perpetuation of the gorilla species, as their habitats are shrinking rapidly due to urban development and as logging encroaches into their homeland, and their numbers are dwindling as they get poached for bushmeat. Anyways, now we're on the level of the tribe, or the sub-sub-family. With the divergence of gorillas into their own tribe, called Gorolini, we're left with the evolutionary tribe called the Hominini, which contains the chimpanzees, the bonobos, and us, the humans. The list is getting smaller and smaller as we prune our family tree to only our most recent ancestors and our closest evolutionary cousins. Shortly after the gorillas diverged from the Hominina family, the Hominini tribe was itself split by another divergence. About the same time, but a little later, from 6 to 8 million years ago, the genus Pan and the genus Homo slowly diverged. Literally, the divergence was really slow, even by evolutionary standards. Most species will undergo a successful speciation event within two to three million years, but this speciation event took upwards of four million years. It's hypothesized that this gradual speciation was caused by a relatively high degree of gene flow that persisted between the diverging Pan and Homo genuses. This is to say that there was a lot of interbreeding between the ancestors of humans and chimps, enough to slow down the evolutionary divergence of their species by more than a million years. It's believed that the speciation was largely finalized around five to six million years ago. The tribe Hominini had split into the genus Pan and the genus Homo. The genus Pan includes the chimpanzees and the bonobos, two species that we are equally related to. You see, we share a common ancestor with both of them, after the main split, the Pan genus would go on to experience another speciation event of its own. This speciation event was extremely recent, you know, geologically speaking, happening less than a million years ago, probably close to around 800,000 years ago. That's incredibly recent, and the process is still ongoing. The chimps and bonobos are still diverging today. As you sit there and listen to me talk about it, the chimps and bonobos are out there right now, in the jungles of Africa, minding their own business, mating and giving birth and dying, and slowly becoming more and more genetically distinct. You might have noticed how things are accelerating. The first cells didn't evolve much complexity for like two billion years, and then it took another billion years for multicellular life to really kick it into gear. 
and it's been around a half billion years since uh, since life really got going on land, you know, producing the huge variety of plants and animals that we see in the fossil record and alive around us. When we trace back the human lineage and look at all of those groups like the gibbons and the orangutans and the gorillas who branched off, it might appear as if the rate of branching is accelerating, as if the younger the clade or the group, the quicker it will diversify and speciate. But it's important to understand that this is an illusory effect caused by sampling bias. We put the orangutan and the gorilla and the chimpanzee and the bonobo, and us, the homo sapiens, we put them all into a group with nothing else, because nothing else survived. There are many hundreds of other cousin species that branch off the larger groups, like the hairs on your arm or the fibers fraying out of a rope. Furthermore, if you listen to my episode on phylogenetics, you should know that the fossil record becomes increasingly sparse and incomplete the further back in time you go. The older a fossil gets, the more likely it is to be destroyed by erosion, the penetrating growth of a tree's roots, or by some trampling animal. We have a much more detailed understanding of life that existed closer to the modern day, as these fossils are overrepresented in the fossil record. When the gorillas diverged, they didn't diverge into just two genuses. The Gorillini tribe diverged dozens of times into many different gorilla species, but through the course of time, the vast majority of these cousin species have gone extinct, and in the modern day, only two small population groups survive. Similarly, there are numerous extinct cousin species of the orangutan and the gibbons, going even further back in time, back before the great apes and the lesser apes had even emerged. We had the ancestors of the old world monkeys, whose subgroups included most of the various primate species that littered the Cenozoic era, and throughout the course of 60 million years, this group no doubt saw hundreds or maybe thousands of speciation events. All of the old world monkeys that exist today, like the baboons, lemurs, macaques, and monkeys, are just a fraction of the total primate biodiversity that existed across the jungles of Africa and Asia 20 or 30 million years ago. The great bulk of these species have all been lost to time, scrubbed into extinction by the pitiless forces of natural selection. This pattern applies not just to gorillas and monkeys and orangutans, but to us as well. We, the Homo sapiens, are the sole survivors of the Homo genus after its five million years of existence. But who were our evolutionary cousins? Who were these lineages that shared the genus Homo? What were they like? And why did they die out? This part of the story involves one of the earliest possible human ancestors, the Artipithecus ramidus, which existed around five million years ago and shares many skeletal features with the bonobo. You know how whenever people talk about human nature, they often compare us to the chimpanzee? They say, look at how aggressive the chimpanzee is. We are like that at a primitive level. War and violence, these are things that are a part of human nature. On the contrary, there's a large and growing body of evidence suggesting that humans are much more like our more docile bonobo cousins than the more aggressive chimps. Bonobos have a much more matriarchal society, more than us, more than even chimpanzees and they're much less aggressive. Groups of bonobos frequently have sex, using sex and sexual favors almost like currency. When two different groups of bonobos meet, they use sex almost like a handshake, whereas the chimps are more territorial and suspicious. When we look at data like the skeletal morphology of the Artipithecus ramidus, we see that it was much more like the bonobo than the chimpanzee. Indeed, this is true when we look at our archeological history. Before the advent of agriculture, humans organized themselves into tribes and villages that operated more like cooperative matriarchal bonobos than the territorial and sometimes violent chimps. This has led many researchers to think that maybe the chimpanzee aggressiveness is a trait they evolved on their own, after splitting from the genus Homo, or even after splitting from the bonobos. It would seem that the bonobo disposition for compassion and cooperation is a trait rooted much deeper in the phylogeny than the chimpanzee predisposition towards territoriality and aggression towards strangers, as we humans evolved with many of the bonobo-like traits. After the Artipithecus, the next possible ancestor of the genus Homo was the Australopithecus, which existed around 4 million years ago. The Australopithecus radiated across the entirety of Africa, diverging into numerous subgroups and sublineages like the Australopithecus anamensis in Kenya, the Australopithecus afarensis in Eastern Africa, and the Australopithecus africanus in Southern Africa. All of these lineages had the bipedal posture of a human, but a primate-looking face with characteristically large cheekbones, a stubby nose, and a protruding mouth. 
and they were covered in thick hair typical of an orangutan or a gorilla. The later populations of Australopithecus coexisted with other humanoid groups, including the Kenyanthropus platyops, which existed a little less than 3 million years ago, and the Paranthropus group that existed around the same time, but lasted a little longer, going extinct around 1.2 million years ago. Of all of these transitional groups that briefly appeared in the evolutionary timeline, only one, called the Homo habilis, is known for sure to be a direct human ancestor. The Homo habilis emerged 2.8 million years ago, retaining many qualities from their ape ancestors, like short legs and torso and long arms with a heavy covering of body hair. The Homo habilis stood only four feet tall, and it had a brain about half again as large as the Australopithecus. Near the end of its existence, Homo habilis coexisted with the newly emerged Homo erectus and Homo ergaster lineages. These new lineages were more upright, as their ancestors had moved out of the receding African forests and into the plains of the savanna. In this new environment, the hominids developed a more erect posture, better for standing upright and walking and running and throwing. They also evolved less hair, as it wasn't really needed under the hot African sun. They're out in the open, in the fields and plains, and they're no longer protected by the tree canopies of the forests. It's believed that the Homo ergaster group gave rise to the Homo erectus group, although the data is subject to much debate and the issue isn't entirely clear. It seems to be a popular opinion that Homo erectus did in fact emerge from a Homo ergaster population, but that other ergaster populations continued to exist as the erectus population diverged and radiated across Africa. Although there is data suggesting that both Ergaster and Erectus coexisted in East Africa for more than 500,000 years, so it's also plausible that they're sibling lineages that diverge from an unknown common ancestor. Regardless of their origins, the Homo Ergaster would stay in Africa and eventually die out, while Homo Erectus populations would move out of Africa and across Europe and Asia. The Homo Erectus lineage itself diverged, giving rise to many new lineages that either stayed in Africa or emigrated outwards, too. The Homo heidelbergensis was one of these species, having descended from the Homo erectus around 700,000 years ago, with population groups that spread out across Africa, Europe, and Asia. This species would go on to give rise to Homo sapiens and our closest humanoid cousins. Groups of Homo heidelbergensis migrating eastward into Asia evolved into the Denisovans about a million years ago. Other groups of Heidelbergensis migrated outwards at a later date, moving northward into Europe, where they evolved into the Neanderthals around 600,000 to 300,000 years ago. Some groups of Neanderthals moved across Western Europe, while others moved east through modern-day Iraq and Iran and into Siberia, where they competed and interbred with the Denisovans who had migrated there hundreds of thousands of years earlier. Our species, Homo sapiens, emerged more than 200,000 years ago from Homo heidelbergensis populations that had stayed in Africa. When the Homo sapien populations began migrating out of Africa around 100,000 to 50,000 years ago, the first thing that they encountered was the Neanderthal populations that existed across the Middle East and Eastern Europe. There was a little bit of interbreeding between these two groups, but this tapered off near the end of the time frame as Homo sapien groups moved out further into North Europe and eventually further east into Asia. As a result of this brief window of interbreeding, all currently living descendants of these Homo sapien groups have Neanderthal DNA composing 1% to 4% of their genome. If your ancestors came from somewhere in Asia or Europe or the Americas, you've almost certainly got some Neanderthal DNA in you. Those descended from Asia have less, while those descended from Europe have more, as the Neanderthals had greater populations in Europe than they did in Asia. By contrast, if you're African, if you're descended from the Homo sapien groups who stayed in Africa and didn't interbreed with the Neanderthals, then you most likely have none of this Neanderthal DNA. In a similar way, the Homo sapien groups migrating out into Asia also interbred with the Denisovan populations that had been living there for many hundreds of thousands of years. Because of this, humans from Asia often have a higher proportion of Denisovan DNA in their genome. For a very short window of time, maybe 40,000 years or so, Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans all coexisted and interbred. Slowly at first, but with increasing pace, the Homo sapiens outbred and outcompeted the other species. We had larger communities, and thus had larger support networks and more effective specialization of labor. Humans had smaller heads than Neanderthals, and so we died less during childbirth, which allowed mothers to have more children on average. 
in just a few thousand years after meeting the Homo sapiens, both the Neanderthals and the Denisovans had been entirely wiped out. Other human cousins that had diverged over the last million years also appeared to go extinct during this time period, including the Homo sapiensis, Homo antecessor, and Homo rhodesiensis. With virtually all their cousin lineages wiped out, the Homo sapiens were quick to acquire global dominance. Population groups moved through Asia, through India and China, to move north into Siberia and Kamchatka. Here, the human populations crossed the Bering Land Bridge that connected Russia to Alaska, migrating into the North American continent around 20,000 to 40,000 years ago. These population groups moved down into South America over the next several thousand years, which saw humans finally settle every continent on the planet except for Antarctica. The story of human evolution is endlessly fascinating and full of surprises. Even after everything we've covered, I still feel as if I barely scratched the surface. To show you what I mean, I'm going to end this episode by talking about three really fascinating tidbits of human evolution. The Homo floriensis, the Toba catastrophe, and the SR Gap 2 duplication event. A short, hobbit-like cousin lineage called Homo floriensis supposedly tagged alongside the larger hominid populations for nearly a million years. Not much is definitively understood about the Homo floriensis, only that they were remarkably tiny. It's believed that they went extinct, although others believe that they weren't really a species in the first place, but instead that they were a subgroup of human populations that suffered from endemic dwarfism. The Pygmies, a group of very diminutive peoples who live across Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands, are thought to be possible descendants of this Homo floriensis group. They're pretty much the closest thing we have to real-world dwarves like Lord of the Rings. Next on the list is the Toba Catastrophe. The Toba Catastrophe occurred about 75,000 years ago, when a supervolcano erupted and threw massive amounts of ash and dust into the air. Like the KT meteor that killed the dinosaurs, this eruption put enough stuff in the atmosphere to block out the sun and wreak havoc with life on the surface. It's believed that this eruption caused a five-year winter, followed by a period of cooling that lasted for a thousand years. During this time of great struggle, many plants and animals were wiped out, and so the human population was reduced to less than 10,000 breeding individuals, maybe as few as 3,000. Think about that. We have 7.4 billion people on the world today you know, in early 2017. But after this event, there was less than 10,000. That's barely a viable gene pool. It's crazy how close we were to being wiped out by this genetic bottleneck. The Homo sapiens could have been just one more in a long list of species lost to time. I should point out that while the Toba supervolcano eruption did happen, and while the human population did reach this really tight bottleneck about 75,000 years ago, it's not definitively proven that one caused the other. The Toba theory as the uh, explanation for the bottleneck is still under debate, but it's a pretty fascinating idea nonetheless. The last, and in my opinion, the most fascinating little detail that I want to share with you involves the SRGAP2 gene, or the SRGAP2 gene. This gene codes for a protein that's expressed in the brain, and the protein helps move and position neurons properly during development. 2.4 million years ago, a human ancestor experienced a mutation to this gene, ultimately creating a shorter duplicate copy. This shortened allele can override the original allele, which interferes with neural cell chemistry in such a way as to actually improve the speed of neural migration and slow the rate of synapse maturation and decay. It's believed that this mutation was an extremely important event in human evolution, leading to a massive reorganization of how the cerebral cortex develops in the fetus. This mutation led to an almost impossibly rapid growth in human brain size, as the new developmental patterns gave offspring nearly 125,000 more neurons than their parents, every generation for thousands of years. Within a stunningly short time frame, the human brain size had doubled, and our capacity for complex thought and abstract reasoning emerged. With that followed 8,000 years of agriculture, 200 years of industry, and 50 years of spaceflight culminating with men walking on the moon and a global internet where people post cat videos and biologic podcasts. And that, dear listener, is the story of human evolution. Thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. 
If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.